Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is the Reverend Dr. John Philip Newell. John Philip is a writer in spirituality, a poet, a scholar, and a teacher. He is also a minister in the Church of Scotland. John Philip, thanks for talking with us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, you are Canadian by birth and live in Edinburgh, Scotland, and travel around the world speaking and teaching. What drew you to Scotland? My mother is Scottish and my father is Irish. And although I'm Canadian-born, we were back and forth a lot as a family, visiting extended family in Scotland. And when it came time to study theology in 1975, I chose to study in Edinburgh. And um, it was there that I met Ali, my wife, and it's in Scotland that we have lived since. Now, much of your writing and teaching has focused on Celtic Christianity. How would you describe that stream of the faith, and how does it compare with others? Perhaps the most uh, distinct feature of the Celtic stream, as opposed to the Mediterranean stream from which most of our Western Christianity has been influenced, perhaps the most significant aspect of this tradition is its celebration that what is deepest within every human being is the sacred image of God. Grace, therefore, is seen as given to reconnect us to what is deepest within us, Mm. not to make us something other than ourselves. So that's the first major distinctive feature that colors absolutely every other aspect of its spirituality and prayer life and, and commitment. The other related uh, emphasis is the belief in the essential sacredness of creation. So that just as we are seen as coming forth from the womb or from the heart of God, so all things are seen as coming forth from the essence of God. And this, this leads to an emphasis on the holy interrelatedness of all things so that uh, we are called to be living really as siblings with the creatures and with the earth. You were the warden of Iona Abbey, and I know some folks who have taken pilgrimages there. What was it like for you to serve there? It was a great blessing to have four years on the Holy Island where people came from the four corners of the earth, and people would be coming with the joys and delights of their nations and the tears and the struggles of their peoples. Often people would, in looking at a map, say to me when I lived on Iona, do you not feel cut off Mm. and are you not living on the very edge of civilization out there? But in fact, Iona is a place where the world converges. Mm. So its great blessing was... Uh, precisely that, being in touch with the great religious traditions and the great nations and cultures of our world and feeling that we were really right at the heart of relationship rather than out on the edge. Hmm. And you've been spending recent summers as companion theologian for the American Spirituality Center of Casa del Sol in the deserts of New Mexico. What does that work involve? Casa del Sol, the little spirituality center, is on the grounds of Ghost Ranch Conference Center. And uh, we are three miles further out into the high desert Mm. than the conference center. And that is a place of pilgrimage also, uh, not, of course, in the same way and with the same history as Iona. But it's a place where many people come from different parts of the country looking for new beginnings. And Casa del Sol, as we say in our vision statement, we are a community of the living presence, looking for the oneness of the human soul Mm. and the healing of creation. So it is a place of retreat. It's a place where we step back, but not stepping away from the human journey and the journey of creation, but looking on how we can be stronger to engage in the work of transformation in our nations and with the species of the earth. That setting in New Mexico is vastly different from Iona. Uh, What have you learned about spiritual practices in light of one's setting? 
Yes, it is, of course, very different from the green of mm. the Western Isles of Scotland and the blue of the of the seas around Iona. But interestingly, it for me produces some some very similar responses. And uh, there is something in the high desert, as there is in the, the Western Isles of Scotland, that is wild and that is exposed and expansive. And uh, I think in both locations, we are blessed to access in a new way the, the wildness of the human soul mm. and to go to a desert place or to go to an exposed uh, place within ourselves in which we renew our connection with what is deepest or most elemental in us, and that is the holy presence. But what if we're unable to go to Iona or New Mexico or any number of other places of retreat? Are there ways that we can center ourselves where we are regardless? Yes, ab absolutely. My great teacher from Iona, Lord MacLeod, who was the founder of the present-day Iona community, used to say about Iona that it was a thin place. And by that he meant there was a thin separation between heaven and earth or between the divine and the human. So there are these places that we call thin, like Iona or Casa del Sol and many other beautiful places of retreat and perspective. But that is not to say that every other place is thick. <laughs> it's really just to say that in these places uh, we are offered what is like a a window or an icon, a glimpse into the presence that is at the heart of all life. And certainly in the case of Iona as well as Casa del Sol, we are committed to focus on the practices, the disciplines, the celebrations that enable us to be strong in the communities and cities that we live in and spend most of our lives in, to be looking for the sacredness that is also and emphatically in those places and to be part of the recovery and the, the birth again of the sacred in the heart of our families and the heart of our communities. You've been broadening your approach to include other faiths in your work, speaking about unity across religious boundaries, as well as on creation spirituality and world peace. Why has this emphasis become important to you? Abrahamic traditions of Christianity, Islam, Judaism are at the heart of some of the most conflicted places of hatred and violence in our world. And I believe that until we recover a sense of relationship and a way of reverently honoring one another between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, there will not be peace in our world. So the working on peace within the Abrahamic traditions is one very specific way of working for peace among us as nations. And I believe that what is at the heart of these great traditions shares much more common ground than, than our differences and our separations. Another aspect of what has led me to work more intentionally in the world of peace between great wisdom traditions are the relationships that I have been gifted with in my life. And especially over the last 10 years, I have been given some very dear relationships with uh, Jewish rabbis and with Muslim imams and teachers. And I have known experientially these teachers to be brothers and sisters. And you bring together these three streams of faith in your new book, Praying with the Earth, a prayer book for peace. Tell us about why you put that beautiful book together. This book grew very much out of the work that I do in the high desert of New Mexico every summer, where my wife, Ali, and I co-teach with a rabbi from Santa Fe, Rabbi Nahum Wardlev, 
and with a, a Sufi Muslim mm. teacher from Abiquiu nearby, Rachma Lutz. And these have been very important weeks and weeks full of illumination and full of challenge. And one of my awarenesses coming out of that experience is that many of us in the Christian household have never heard the sacred scriptures of the Quran, let alone use them to pray for peace. Mm -hmm. And the gifts of these distinct traditions are important to, to be open to. And my experience is that in receiving great gifts from other traditions, I'm, ne I'm led not away from the heart of my own devotion to Jesus, but that these gifts throw new light mm. on my devotion to the way of Jesus. So I see these rich inheritances as given not to compete with each other, but very, very emphatically to complete each mm. other. You have another new book which expands on this goal of peace and unity in the world in a much fuller way, a new harmony, the spirit, the earth, and the human soul. And here you seek to reveal the connectedness of everything from the similarities shared between the world's faiths to the close relationship between science and spirituality, between spirituality and the natural world. In this fractured and divisive world, that concept is so appealing. How is it possible? A New Harmony, I began during a sabbatical year in which Ali and I spent a good part of the year in New Harmony, mm. Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, New Harmony, as its name would suggest, was the site of a utopian community committed to a type of new harmony with the earth and a new social harmony. And it is also a place that has been profoundly influenced by the theology and teachings of the great American German theologian Paul Tillich, who as early as the 1940s was prophetically speaking of God as the very ground of being. And Tillich's prophetic insights speak into the heart of where most of us, many of us are now, seeking to reconnect with the one who is the very ground of all life. So in the book, A New Harmony, which has a threefold emphasis and a threefold approach, I begin by inviting us to remember again and again and again the essential harmony or the, what can be called the ancient harmony or the interrelatedness of everything in the cosmos. The second part of the book names the brokenness of the harmony. Mm. And I believe that the path forward is a path that must take us through this confessing, naming, addressing, looking right into the face of how broken we are as individuals and as families, as communities and as species. And the third part of the book that I call A New Harmony is one in which I especially ask the question, what is the cost of transformation? Mm. That is, how will we apply this growing awareness of life's interrelatedness? How will we apply this in action? How will we apply it in our relationship as nations? How will we find strength to live the realization that we will not be well as a nation as long as we are ignoring the well-being of other nations or exploiting the well-being of other nations. So a key part of the question, and it's a question that I ask within the Christian household, but I offer it also to other great traditions, and that is how can we enable one another to take up the cost or the sacrifice that is involved in new beginnings. John Philip, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Peter. It's been a delight.